Thank you again very much for the invitation, Frank. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, okay, so uh, let me start by giving you a plan about what I'm going to do today and, uh, and uh, Wednesday. <coughs> uh, of course, I mean, what I'm going to talk about is independent from what we've been doing uh, the last uh, in May. <laughs> So today, today I'll be um, I'll be talking about uh, I'll be talking about the stationary parental system and Wednesday Wednesday I will be talking about the the parental system with, with the, evolu the evolution parental system. Um, so again, the stationary parental system is the is parental, but without the without this term. So it will be So this is the equation on U, and then we have the incompressibility condition that allow us to, to get V from U. And then usually the way we do this is that we impose U at x equals 0 to be some profile, u0 of y, and then um, when y goes to infinity to okay so let me re-explain a few things. So mo more or less we are interested in fr solving this in the domain x bigger than 0, y bigger than 0. Okay. So, so basically the picture should have in mind, so this is x. You take some x equals 0 here. You impose an initial condition, uh, which is this u0 of y. And then <coughs> this u0 of y is positive, right? u0 of y would be positive. So then this guy is positive. And then the equation itself, you will think about it as some evolution equation in x. OK, so x plays the role of time, right? So then you want to solve this till some time or some x, x star, right? So this is where you are going to solve, right? So the idea is really we are thinking about this as some evolution equation in x, okay? So this is the stationary parental. So um, today the plan is to discuss three types of results. I'm not going to go into details of all these things, but there will be three types of result that I'll, I'll be mentioning. And more or less, these three types, I will be discussing more or less exactly similar three types of result for the, um, for the full system with the, with the UT term uh, on Wednesday. So <coughs> the first result will be a result about blow up for the blow up result. I mean, the term blow up, uh, um, maybe it's not the best term used, but it's more separation. That's the term that we use usually, the separation of boundary layer. So then there is another type of result, which is um, long time asymptotics or, or large x asymptotics, but 
Of course, you'll be seeing that uh, large x um, large x behavior. And then another type of result that, uh, okay, I will not go too much into details about it, but validity of the parental system. Okay, so this is related to what we discussed last time. Validity of parental. Validity of parental means that if I take a solution of Navier-Stokes, uh, it can be well approximated by Prentor, right? So, <coughs> um, and these are, I mean, I'll be mentioning two results here. Um, okay, so these are more or less the, the, the plan for today. Um, for Wednesday, we'll be talking about a result about separation, but for the evolution problem and also some results about validity for the evolution problem also. Okay, any questions? No? Okay, so um, for one and two, I mean, in one case, we will only be solving till some value x star in the other case, we will be solving globally. What's the difference? Um, the difference will always come from the pressure, whether the pressure is helping you or is acting against you, right? So more or less here, this equation, you can solve it as long as u is positive. As long as you are positive, as long as you are positive, this looks like some evolution equation in X, right? So your enemy is when you start become, tries to become negative, that's your enemy. So, so here, but you are forcing you by this guy, right? So if this guy is, is big or equal than zero, maybe you expect that you can solve this globally. Whereas if this, term is negative, that's where it's acting against you, okay? So, so that's what we call a uh, favorable or adverse pressure condition. Okay. okay, so let's first, let me first um, recall a result um, from Olenik, a result where she proves uh, local existence for for the for the system. <coughs> I think I, I may have mentioned this uh, maybe around sixty four or so. I, I mean, I will try to state more or less the how the result goes. Um, yeah, m maybe just one remark. I didn't insist on this again. So. Um, this guy is the Euler flow, right? So, so normally the parental system that we are normally, I mean, we will be having parental here and here we have Euler, right? So the limit y goes to infinity, when y goes to infinity here, that corresponds to Euler on the boundary, right? So basically this guy, if you are in the Euler flow, this corresponds to the boundary value of Euler, right? And of course now it's not difficult to see that there is a, s a compatibility between this guy and this guy because when y goes to infinity, you expect this guy to go to zero and you will be having only these two terms. So normally what you what what we expect to have what we should be having is that u euler ok 
okay? Right, so this equation, this is the x derivative of, this is the x derivative. Okay. This is, and basically this equation is the trace of the Euler equation on the boundary. So if you take the Euler equation uh, up and you take the trace on the boundary, that's what you get. Of course, I mean, for what we are doing today, we don't care about this. I mean, we are just looking at Prentol. But, I mean, if you are trying to understand the coupling between the two, that's where it takes place. The other thing here in this model is that the Prentol system does not affect the Euler flow, right? We are only seeing we are only seeing the effect of the Euler flow on the Prentor. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was thinking about adding a fourth point, but I don't think I will have time. But let, let me just put it, but I will not talk about it. But there are, related to this question, I mean, there are slightly more involved model than Prentor that somehow try, I mean, like people saw that the parental system is not always the good thing. So um, they wanted to find models where what happens here can affect what happens here, right? So they wanted to see some feedback of the parental on the Euler. Um, so then there are models, there are few, a lot of physics papers dealing with a uh, few models. The mathematics about it are still, still, uh, I mean, there are starting, uh, there are a few results now um, that okay, I can mention by uh, Dalibar, uh, David Gerard-Varey, and then there is also some recent work of uh, Samir Ear and uh, Vicol about trying to understand um, what is called like triple deck models where they, there are three layers here or interactive boundary layer models. I mean, all these are models where you, you try to see a feedback from the parental on the Euler, okay? Um, okay, I will not be talking about them here. Okay, now, <coughs> if I go back now to the result I want to mention about uh, from Olenik. So you take some u0, which is, let's say, c2 alpha bounded, some c2 alpha function, which is bounded. Uh, u0 of 0 is 0, and u0 prime of 0 is positive. Um, the limit of u0 is okay, and u0 of y, okay. So basically, I mean, you have some a profile. You have a profile of this nature, like it. Um, your profile is more or less something like that, okay? This is y, this is u0 of y. Okay, so it's a positive. Um, okay, now in this assumption, in this assumption, the, this is not necessarily monotone, so it can be, it can even do this, right? In this assumption, it can do this, for instance, right? For here, this is also valid. Okay, so the other assumption, so this is first assumption on u0. We have another assumption that, let's say this is c1. Uh, there is a compatibility condition. There's a compatibility condition that states that um, 
is a big O of y2 when y goes to 0. Um, which is more or less, you can understand it because we, um, oh, maybe I didn't write it down. Right, I didn't write down the fact that u, u at y equals 0 equal v at y equals 0 equals 0. Right, so we have also this boundary condition. Um, actually, from that boundary condition, normally what, what you have, you have that u behaves like some constant times y at 0. And v behaves like constant time y square, right? v is like y square at the boundary. Uh, but then the transport term, this plus this, the transport term behaves like y square at the boundary. So then since the transport term behaves like y square, this plus this should behave like y square, like y square. So that's your compatibility condition. Right, so the compatibility condition is coming from the fact that you expect these things to happen at zero. Okay. Okay. So then these are the assumptions of uh, Olenic, and then the conclusion is that if we have these, then there exists x star positive, such that the Prandtl system has a local solution, which is, let's say, C1 in 0x star um, open, I mean, it can blow up at x star, times R plus. OK? So, so basically, is that you can solve, you can solve from x equals 0 till x equal x star, and at x star something bad can happen or some separation happens. Okay, now <coughs> um, the solution constructed by Olenik satisfies some extra, uh, so it sa satisfies some regularity. So, I mean, uh, I mean, at least like you can prove that two derivatives are under control and so on. Um, so let's say u is bounded, continuous. Um, derivatives in y, derivatives in y actually are um, bounded and continuous still including, I mean, um, till x star, but um, derivatives in x, dx, u, v, or uh, uh, dx, u, and v are locally bounded. Are locally bounded. is more or less understood. I mean, the reason is that when you approach the separation, I mean, the separation will be the, po uh, the point x star where u, where u um, will be, can touch zero in a sense. Uh, but then you lose control on this kind of derivatives. Um, so, so this is the sum of the property that we have. OK, now this is regularity. Um, the other property is some sort of non-degeneracy, which says that u of x, y is positive for
Okay. And uh, so that's the. And then the other important remark is that if the pressure is favorable, if the pressure is favorable, meaning that if if the pressure is um, if the pressure is negative, dP. If this term is negative, then x star equal infinity. Okay. <coughs> if the pressure is not acting against you, um, then you can prove you can do it globally. Okay. Now, what happens if we have separation? Um, what is separation here? Now, if x star, if x star is finite, <coughs> so meaning if the pressure is um, acting against you, so there are two possible scenarios. There are two possible scenarios. Um, the first one is that the y derivative at zero of the y derivative at zero at the point x star is zero. Remember, like when we started, we started like this, right? Right. So we our starting our starting slope is strictly positive or <coughs> there exist y star positive such that u of x star y star equals zero okay L let me try to explain these two things um, usually like here okay here I'm putting y like this and u like that uh, Sometimes when we draw these profiles, we like drawing them th th slightly the other way around. Like I'll be drawing them like like you see them in uh, some of the pictures. So, <coughs> so um, so the profile I'm s we started with, the profile we start with is let's say a profile like that. So uh, again, here I'm more or less changing the. Um, um, this is my u. U u is this, right? Now now I, I change. Uh, this is u. This is u of y. So y is like this, and this is my u of y. Okay, so I I just change the axis. This is how usually we draw them. And I'll explain why. I mean, the idea is that you think about this as being x, and you are trying to see how your u of y evolves with x. Okay, so that's why we like many times you like drawing it this way. So this will be your initial data. Okay, so th this will be your initial profile, for instance. Um, so then, what can happen? Either this happens. So this happens means uy equal zero. Uy equal zero means that your profile becomes something like that. Right? Because remember, this is my y, this is my u, u of y. Okay. At at the point x star. So this will be the point x equals zero, right? So my profile that was like this, due to the pressure term, the unfavorable pressure term, it is pushing. So then you get this. So this will correspond to one. Um, that's the first. This is the first scenario. The second scenario. The second scenario. 
Um, the second scenario is that um, something like this happens. It touches here. Okay. So the second scenario can only happen if <coughs> your profile is not monotone in Y. Right? Your profile, so this is Y, this is U of Y. The second scenario can only happen if um, you are not monotone in Y. Okay. <coughs> Is this clear? Right. Of course, now, <coughs> this is also. Um, so this is theorem. Uh, this, is, this is theorem. This goes back to Olenic. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, goes back to Olenic, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a theorem, like what, what can, the, the two, the two cases where you lose, wh where you cannot solve globally is either this one or this one. Of course, now, <coughs> if this happens, and this is what we, what we usually expect, um, there are a lot of questions about how can you extend the solution afterwards. Physically, what happens here, this is the point of separation that we call separation of the boundary layer. And then what you expect afterwards is that you get a flow which looks like that. Right? So we, we have a flow that goes uh, backward. Now in terms of well posedness of that sort of transport equation, uh, this is bad. I mean, like, so one has to understand this really differently. Like, you cannot just think about, um, just thinking about x as being time will not be working uh, very well. I mean, you have to, you have to think about that. And that's, as, as of now, it's not very clear how one can attack these problems mathematically. Okay. Now, <coughs> there's one 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 important case. There's one important case where we can actually rule out this. Um, if now, if our origin of if our starting profile u0 is monotone okay monotone means it has to be increasing right if it is monotone so it's like the picture i draw here then only one can happen then two cannot happen The reason that two cannot happen is that the, this monotonicity, you keep it. You can prove that if u0 of y is monotone, then u of x, ux of y as a function of y stays monotone, right? So if you start, if you start with a profile like this, which is monotone, you keep it monotone. So if you keep it monotone, you can never, you can never have this you can only get this, okay? <coughs> um, proving this is, is not completely trivial. Like if you want to go through the whole proof, it uses uh, some sophisticated version of maximum principle. It's, it's one level, uh, it's, it's more than just maximum principle. You, lo you use uh, something called comparison principle which is like maximum principle, but it allows you to compare. Um, um, okay. Any questions? No? Okay. Now, the first result I want to mention, as I said, is to describe the separation, right? So, um, an important question is to try to understand what happens here exactly. 
right? How how does this how does how does the separation happen? Okay, so that's the first result I want to describe. <coughs> So let me write down this theorem. So this is a theorem that um, so it's with Anlord Alibar. Okay. Okay. So I mean, there are a lot of assumptions for this theorem. I'm not going to give all the assumptions, but maybe some of the important ones. Um, but more or less, the conclusion of the, of the theorem is that it gives us, it tells us exactly how this guy, how this guy goes to zero as a function of x. So, so if I define, uh, so uh, let me start by a short version. If I define lambda of x to be ui, of x zero, uh, of x zero, okay. So that's the derivative in y, uh, right? Then, um, then we know that lambda of x will go to zero when x goes to x star. That's really the definition of x star being the separation point. But we can say more. I mean, we can say that lambda of x behaves like some constant square root of x star minus x. And we can be more precise about, about this. But this is really the short version of the result. OK? Uh, OK, so uh, what are the assumptions? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be giving the assumption. So th this is the what we call, like at least what we think, to be the stable, the stable separation process. Okay, and this is um, this confirms um, some of the formal asymptotics done more more or less in the forties, fifties, and sixties. So at least some of the Goldstein has some formal asymptotics, Stewartson. They have some formal asymptotics. There is also an interesting Landau himself also has some very interesting uh, heuristic about why it should be uh, like that. Okay. Okay, now what is the, what is the, what are the assumptions? So, let's say we need some regularity. I think seven derivatives are, are okay. U zero increasing. We start with some lambda zero, which is the U zero prime at zero, which is positive. Okay. We have to take this to be already small. So our lambda zero will be small. <coughs> so the second type of assumptions are assumptions that are the second types. These are assumptions that will be used in maximum principle arguments. Uh, sorry, so you are saying that lambda zero is small compared to what? Okay, All right. So it's it's good that your question is good. Uh, it will be small compared to one, and the reason is that I'm going to take the pressure term to be. Uh, one, right? So, so here, in my result, this is equal to minus one. Okay. So, I already, I'm already, I already show, I already, ch I'm already choosing um, a size here, which is one. So then, uh, lambda zero will be small compared to that. Okay.
So then um, u0 w prime minus 1 the infimum between y square and 1. Okay, so and then we have also an assumption on the fourth derivative. The fourth derivative is um, of u0 is bounded from above and below. Okay, um, I mean, as of now, it's not clear where these things are used. Uh, I, I mean, all these assumptions are not completely necessary, and you can relax them if you want, <coughs> modulo making the proof more complicated, right? But, but what is behind, behind it at the end, and the end of the day, is that what we really need, which is now point three, right here. Now point three is that our u0, we can write it as some approximate u0 plus v0. So the u0 approximate is some sort of approximate profile that um, we can construct by hand. And then we try to close some energy estimate on this uh, v0, right? So that, that will be the idea. Now, our u0 app will be what? Lambda 0 y, okay? So that's the derivative, <coughs> plus y squared over 2. The y square over 2, that's, that's related to the um, white y square over 2. That's related to the fact that the pressure is minus 1. The, the pressure term is minus 1. So it's related exactly to this condition, right? That condition tells you that this term, this term has to be, this term has to be y square over 2. Okay? Plus, Okay, also th there's no y3 term also because of that. y to the 3 term, there's no y to the 3 term because of that. So, <coughs> so, so, so you see, the, this, guy, this guy is like the compatibility condition at the first order. Like you just take the equation and that's the first compatibility condition. The next terms that you are seeing here, they are coming from higher order compatibility condition that, you, that your solution should satisfy. So I'm not going to write everything, but we need some other terms. You mean, but you mean at, at zero? Or? Yeah, yeah, this is at zero. Yeah, yeah at zero. Okay, so I'm not, go I'm not writing everything, but we need this till maybe the order y to the 10, for instance. We need to know the terms. I mean, you can compute them, right? You can compute them just from, from the equation. Okay. Um, and then our v0, what we, what we can say about v0 after we remove all those terms, v0 is less than some constant uh, plus some con another constant y8. Um, yeah, maybe I don't want to go into some unnecessary details, but l l let me here write down everything so that at least you get a sense about uh, how things are scaling. So 
Right, so maybe this doesn't make a lot of sense because I didn't write all the terms here. I mean, there are some other terms. And you have to push this till like y to the 11, more or less. You, you need some sort of good compatibility condition at, at, the, at the origin. <coughs> so, but then after you remove those terms, you want your rest, the error here, to be of this size, okay? Um, I mean, basically, you need it to vanish till the order y to the 7, right? So the other terms, they come just from scaling. Whenever you make the scaling, that's the natural thing to put, okay? And one important, I mean, the important thing in all this, even though, I mean, this is really the one of the technical parts that I will not be discussing too much, but if I put remarks, whenever, if one looks carefully, is that V0 is much smaller than the, the approximate solution. And this happens if lambda 0 is small. Under that condition, oh yeah, I should mention that this, we need this for y small. Uh, and more precisely, we need it in this region. Um, I'm just writing down what is needed in the proof. Um, <coughs> but at this level, you just think about it as Taylor expansion at 0. Right? So you just do the Taylor expansion at zero, use the equation, and, and then you can, if, if your solution has enough regularity, then all these terms are completely necessary. <coughs> um, so the second remark, um, which is related to what I mentioned there, is that the monotonicity of u0, the monotonicity of u0 is propagated right? The monotonicity of u0 pro is uh, propagated. Again, I insist, like, we are prescribing some sort of Taylor expansion to the order 7, and, um, and this is needed to derive our estimates, because we'll be taking higher derivatives, so that's why we need uh, a Taylor expansion at to, to higher level. <coughs> so then, um, the conclusion is what? The conclusion is that there exists some C0 positive. There exists epsilon 0 positive, such that if our lambda 0 is less than epsilon 0, then there exists x star finite. Actually, more precisely, x star is some big O of lambda 0 square. So it's really your x star here is, is not that big, such that such that lambda of x, lambda of x being the, the, the number that I defined there, lambda of x will behave like some constant square root of x star minus x, okay? As x goes to x star, okay? So it's more or less, it, giving, it's, it, it gives us exactly what is the rate of, what is the rate of separation. Okay, now uh, C0, C0 is the number that appears uh, here, there, um, Le C0 apparaît dans l'équivalent, c'est ça Tu as mis parce que tu as mis Ouais, 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 là, ouais, de, ouais, it appears, uh, yeah. Okay, <coughs> so, okay, so this is the statement. 
this is the statement. Um, I'll just give a few ideas about the proof uh, without uh, going into all details. Um, of course, I mean, this is really the, the, just the statement about the lambda of x. I mean, the proof has in it the fact that v is uh, much, I mean, is normally what we are proving is that v is much smaller than the u app. Okay. <coughs> okay, now how are we going to prove the, this result? So we have this lambda of x. Lambda of x is the, I mean, that's what we are interested in. We are, we are, trying, to, we are trying to find how lambda of x goes to 0, right? Um, I mean, more precisely, we are trying to see what is the stable, uh, what is the stable behavior of lambda of x. Um, I mean, we are, not, we are not necessarily saying that all separation should happen with that lambda of x. And as of now, we don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe there may be other ways. But we are trying to identify the stable, the stable behavior. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's start by... <coughs> Asking a question: What are the, what are, what are the scalings that keep the equation uh, invariant? Okay, so what are the invariant scaling of the equation? So, uh, the fact that I put a pressure, the fact that I put a pressure reduces a little bit the allowed scalings. Right, so if I don't put a pressure, so if I don't put a pressure, if I say I have terms like this, if I don't put a pressure, uh, there are more scalings in these equations. And actually, I will be discussing one later on, which is related to the so-called uh, Blasius profile. Uh, for the Blasius profile, we scale x like y square for the Blasius profile. But here we are putting a pressure, so this is minus 1. So, um, so here, the, the <coughs> if you solve the equation, if you solve p, Then, if I look at u lambda, then I need to put here lambda square. OK, lambda is not necessarily the one there, but it afterwards it will be more or less. Right, so if u solves this equation, <coughs> and you do this scaling, then this will also solve the, the equation, the same one, right? It's not difficult to see it. Avec, uh, avec moins o? Yeah, to keep it mo minus 1. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you don't put this, if you put, no, if you don't put this, then you have more scalings. You can. Uh, Putting this reduces the scaling. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, so this is the natural scaling that one would like to do. And so, so then, so I think, so all this is inspired, of course, from works uh, on singularity formation for Schrodinger, like uh, Franck and uh, Pierre. Um, so inspired by those works, like what we, what we introduce the following change of coordinate, we, we look at <coughs> u of sy to be lambda minus 2 Okay, where S um, <coughs> dS over dx okay. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe in my notation I should have um, Okay, so maybe it's confusing the lambda here and there, but that's 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 more or less. I mean, you are extracting the profile. You are extracting the profile from um, <coughs> okay. okay. Now this change of uh, so this is now the object we are interested in. This is the object we are interested in. Again, the way we are scaling, the way we are scaling things, the, way, the reason we are putting lambda, the reason we are putting four, the reason we are putting two here. I think these are the the things that one should ask: why, why we are putting it like that? Is really motivated by the fact that the equation is invariant under this uh, under this scaling. <coughs> okay. So now the nice thing that happens is that this profile u of s y satisfies now a nice equation. Nice equation. Okay, it will. It will. <coughs> so capital U solves um, the following. U U S So it's just change of coordinate, right? So, <coughs> okay, I have to write down what is B. So B, B is equal to minus two lambda x lambda three which is also minus minus 2 lambda s over lambda. Okay, so that's really the equation in the new coordinate system. Okay, so basically all what we did, all what we did is uh, just to explain how that comes, it's not difficult. Okay, so we started from the x, y coordinate. We make the change of coordinate to S capital Y, where 
ds over dx is 1 over lambda 4 and capital y is small y over lambda right so we just make that change of coordinate so then um, just the, the you rewrite the equation and that's what you that's what oh, oh yeah and and also we made the u of s y exactly that guy lambda minus two u of x y. Make sense? The, the the other thing the other thing is that in this formulation I'm not using uh, I'm not using v. I mean if I mean I mean you, you may ask why What's the meaning of this guy, for instance? Uh, but this is just v, but written in the new coordinate system, right? Um, so basically, like whenever you take those derivatives, you have these are like the transport term. The reason you get these extra two terms that's coming from when the derivatives is hitting the scaling, that when you are differentiating the lambda, right? <coughs> right, so when you are differentiating the lambda, you are getting these two extra terms. And this is coming from the uyy in the new coordinate system, it becomes this guy. Okay, now is that clear or you, you want me to go? You can spend like five, ten minutes to do this, but maybe you can skip that. Okay. <coughs> So the other thing, the other thing is that um, the limit when y goes to infinity of u s y becomes some u infinity of s. Um, so the u infinity of s is corresponding; it corresponds to this guy, to the u Euler. Um, uh, as I mentioned, like the, uh, the U Euler satisfies, normally the U Euler satisfies U Euler, U Euler prime, um, U Euler, U Euler prime equal minus one. Okay. So, um, <coughs> and you can, you can see what this means. It means that you can take your U Euler to be the square root of some um, x0 minus x. Maybe there is a 2. Maybe the 2 is this. Uh, okay, always forget. Uh, 2. can always write it down, something like that, because I it means that the o u Euler square over 2 prime e equal minus 1. So it, you can solve it exactly. Derivatives in x, this is minus 1, so you can, it, ha it should be of that form. Um, now when you change this u Euler into the s variable, it becomes something like that. Um, but then this guy now will solve. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, I need to understand that. Uh, so uh, if you solve that, so you are there, uh, uh, if you take this compared, okay, so the, the, the x star is before x is zero. Uh, uh, yeah, the x star will be before x zero. X zero is, is uh, can be large. Okay. 
x0 is a... Uh, well, it has to be a theorem, but I uh, mean, here, uh, no, okay, so, uh, so e, u0 is defined, u... I, I mean, okay, I mean, here, you, you don't, uh, I don't need to, I don't need to tell you that x0 is coming from here, I can tell you, from the beginning I tell you, okay, this is my profile, I'm choosing some u Euler of this nature. And then you make uh, and then I make those all those assumptions, but all those assumptions will imply that x zero has to be slightly large. It cannot be too small. And x star will be pretty small. Maybe. Exactly. Okay. Okay. But this hasn't. I mean, doesn't have to be very large. Like x zero is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, this equation. This equation that happens at infinity for that system translates here to something in the s variable uh, that has this extra b. Okay, I mean when you do the change of coordinate you get this extra term. Um, okay. And it's a good exercise. I think I'll, I'll I mean, I really encourage you to do all these small calculations so that you see how the change of coordinate is happening. <coughs> okay, so the last thing about this system that another important fact about it is, is the fact that, I mean, and that was the reason behind all this change of coordinate. The, the change of coordinate, um, will also imply that, I write it down here, even though I think this is an important thing, is that u y at zero, what should this be? When we do the change of coordinate. So we started lambda, lambda was u lambda x zero. And we made this change of coordinate. Right, so now if I look at capital U lambda, right, capital U lambda, um, uh, capital U y, when I take the y derivative here, there is a lambda that comes out, right? So this will be what? Lambda minus 1, u, u y. OK? But u y, u y was lambda. This is lambda, lambda so this is 1. Right, so the scaling was done so that u lambda is uh, identically 1. Okay. Make sense? Now, the, the next term, the y square over 2 term, but by the way, the y square over 2 term is, is something that stays all the time. This expansion at 0 this compatibility condition at zero, that derivative, like the second derivative at zero, has to stay always like that. And of course, I mean, that will, like this equation will satisfy it also, right? Because of the scaling. I mean, that the scaling really keeps the, the y square, the y square uh, term. And you can see it, like if you take the second derivative here, the this these two cancel. Okay. So so now now you can just look at this. You can forget about the original system. You can forget completely about the original system. I mean the the condition we have on the on the initial data. You can translate it into the new um, on capital U 
because like at the end we'll be doing estimate in this in this coordinate system so you can completely forget about um, the original system the only thing the only thing that you have to keep in mind is is uh, uh, also lambda also lambda you can forget about it because lambda doesn't um, doesn't really appear here like so the fact that b is this guy this i will only need this i will only need to go back but as of now i can forget about this guy so then i'm all i'm having I'm, i need to solve this equation i need to solve this equation but globally in s right maybe i didn't insist on this but when uh, when x goes to x star we expect s to go to infinity right um, and then the question is okay can we can we solve this and what is the natural behavior of b what i mean how should we choose b right um, of course now when you get to this point um, I don't know whether like saying that B is like 1 over S is okay we'll be proving that B is 1 over S is the stable behavior but I don't know whether there is a clear precise intuition why why it has to be 1 over s it's not clear right yeah of course of course for it's not always the case right? yeah it's not always the case yeah yeah but but uh, i mean f f at least for us it was motivated by and also the use of the letter B, I mean, can explain why. Um, yeah, so, um, so we will prove that B of S behaving like 1 over S is some sort of stable behavior. Right? So again, again, I, I want to insist on on how now we are going to try to um, solve the, the the original problem. First, I forget about the original problem. I only look at this equation. I can forget about this one. I look at this equation with <coughs> this prescribed behavior with this behavior at infinity with this uh, compatibility condition at infinity and with the original profile of course now the my original solution u0 i can translate it and now my goal is to find the goal is to find uh, so the goal is to find some and b i want to solve globally i want to find u of s y and some b that solve that that equation okay so 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 honestly i don't know if if, if you get to this point and you don't have a precise intuition about what should you what should be be, be if you don't think that if, if you don't say okay i want b to be one over s i i, I don't know how to proceed right so the, I, I i find that at some point there is uh, something you can get you need some intuition from somewhere to say okay let me let me assume that b to be like that you do some calculations and then you close it at the end. Um, of course, of course, there will be a place where. <coughs> no, I, I mean maybe I'm slightly wrong. So, like while doing the, 
while constructing the approximate solution, while constructing the approximate the solution, there is a place where you want bs plus b square to be more or less zero. It's, it's essential. If not, you can't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But of course, I mean, at the beginning, I mean, to start your expansion, you have to have in, in mind that b should be small, at least. Otherwise, otherwise you will not even start. So. <coughs> Okay, now let me just give you, um, without going into the whole detail, the, um, the steps of the proof. Okay, so I'll just give the steps of the proof. So step one is to construct an approximate solution. Mm. So right, so we, we, we want to construct an approximate solution in, in what? It turns out that there are two ways of thinking about the problem, and more or less they, they give you the, the both work. Um, the first way is to say, OK, b is small. Let me expand in b. You can try to expand in b. You say b is small, and you expand in b. So. Um, You can try to expand in B. You can look at, you can say, OK, my starting point is, um, I will call it, I think I'm calling it U0 or U1. Uh, yeah, let me be consistent. Yeah, so U1, U1 will be Y plus Y squared over 2. OK, I mean, you can check. It's not difficult to check if that. If you put that into the equation, if you put that into the equation, it solves the equation. Uh, you put b equals 0. You put b equals 0, you plug that in. So it's, it's something that is independent of s. So the first two terms, they cancel. I'm taking b equals 0, so, and then, right? So this solves the equation with b equals 0. Solves p. With b equals zero. Okay. And in the language of the Schrodinger equation, this will correspond to to a soliton for the or the ground state for the problem. Of course, it doesn't solve. It doesn't satisfy the good boundary conditions because it's unbounded. I mean, whereas uh, we expect this guy when y goes to infinity, to go to something uh, uh, finite. Of course, I mean, this guy can grow with s because of the rescalings. Okay, so you have u1, and then, and then you can keep solving, you can keep expanding in b. So I can try to find some u app. I will write it down as plus bt1 plus b2t2 and so on. I'm expanding in b. Um, for instance, I mean, if the, the t1, the bt1 term, the bt1 term should be, um, I mean, if you think a little bit about it, you need dyy of t1 
dyy of t1, this has to cancel the term coming from uh, exactly this one. I just show I just show you the first guy. I will not uh, go into the. So the BT1 term, the BT1 term, the BT1 term here, the BT1 term here will cancel the term coming from BU1, these two terms. Like the BT1 cancel these two. Right? As of now, I, I don't need to know, as of now, I don't need to know what is the law of B, how B behaves as a function of S. Right? So this you can calculate. And then you can calculate exactly this will give you T1, which is some uh, minus A4. So this gives us T1 equal minus A4 uh, Y4. And A4 is 1 over 48. Okay, you can you just compute. And it's just, um, you can see all these guys here. Uh, leading order, you have a, a term like y square. I mean, this will be like some constant times y square. <coughs> <coughs> so then, what happens is that, and this is where, where there is the choice of b will come. Um, Let me just explain here, and then maybe we'll. So now, if I look at, if I call u2 equal u1 plus bt1, <coughs> and then I plug u2 in the equation, right? I plug u2 in the equation. So I, I will write down equation applied to u2. So equation, I, I, I mean by that uh, equation of u means this guy, plus 1. Okay, so normally what I'm trying to do is to write, to find equation of u equals 0, right? So if I write down, if I write down the equation applied to u2, what is the error that I find? I will find... OK, so there are some calculations that one has to do. OK. So, so basically, U2 is an approximate solution. It's not a solution because when you put equation of u2, you don't find 0, but you find something. OK? You find something. And you find a term which is growing like y to the 5, a term y to the 6, a term like y to the 8. OK. <coughs> now, now comes the place where I want to tell you what is BS, uh, how, should, how I should choose B, right? Um, and again, I mean, this is also a little bit inspired by works of Ronk and Pierre. And, uh, so um, you look here and you see the term which has y to the 8 has a B times B2. So this is B3. So, so this coefficient is smaller than this one or this one, right? This coefficient is smaller than this one and this one. Okay, so you can convince yourself that you can forget about this one at this level. So you have this one and this one. Now, this guy grows like y to the 5. This guy grows like y to the 6. 
and it's better to make this zero because then this growth will be weaker. So that's how you choose your B. You choose it so that this is like zero, right? So you say, okay, I want BS plus B2 to be zero. A at least whenever, w when you are constructing your approximate solution, like afterwards it will be, it will not be exactly zero, but it will be lower order terms. Mm -hmm. But in the construction of the approximate solution, in the construction of the approximate solution, we can just replace uh, B by, uh, so, so yeah, so, so then I, I'm going to choose BS plus B2 to be zero, which means like B equal one over S, right? So whenever I'm go going to construct my approximate solution, each time I see uh, BS, uh, each time I see B, I can replace it by one over S. Okay. So, <coughs> of course, now if you make that thing, then you can keep constructing your approximate solution to any order, right? And um, So then I can say that um, I'm going to construct T, uh, so uh, U2, yeah, so U3 will be my U2 plus B T2. And then I can write down the equation on uh, B T2. So, so basically the main term, the main term that you have to cancel is this guy. And that's why your T2, your T2 is some sort of minus A7. Uh, sorry, so there's a B2 here. Okay. And A7 is also explicit. A7 is 1 over. A4. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. So, so then, then what happens? Um, le le let me just show this because I mean I was not really planning to go into this detail, but I just want to show you at the end how the law, um, how the law closes. But when you do it this way, so then you are looking at your solution as what I'm calling the approximate solution plus some error. And the whole thing is to close some estimate on this guy. Now, <coughs> since we expanded till this level, so since we removed this guy, this guy it will start with terms like y to the 7, which is like consistent with this kind of, the, with this guy here. So, <coughs> so basically our V3, Sy, we can, we can see what are the first terms in the expansion here. You can compute them. Of course, now when I when I write down the precise thing, I for I, I I put back Vs Bs plus, and actually the control of V3 will allow me to control this guy. This is how the control of this guy will be coming. It will come it will come from controlling V3 over y to the seven. Okay, so plus other terms. Let me not write them down, but a term like y to the eight and so on. But this is more or less, at the end of the day, this is how the, how the law on BS plus B2 will be derived. It will be derived from uh, getting some good estimate on V3, okay?
Okay, maybe I should uh, almost finish with this. Let but I have a question about uh, the formal approach here. If you decide to cancel the order file in, uh, in YouTube, yes. This one? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know, I see that you have all the time odd, uh, odd power, of, uh, power of Y, so does, will, uh, does this will uh, make appear something like uh, even uh, power of Y? Or no, 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 no. Uh, actually, actually, they are. I mean, they, they, they are. Um, here, there are also some power eight, eight. So it's not really. So, so the next term has a power eight, um, and th and this coefficient is explicit. Like you can compute it. Uh, so it's not a question about even and or odd. Um, but for me, it's more like a question about stability. Um, if you try to, if you try to cancel this guy, uh, I think I think my, my my thinking is that if you cancel this guy, you get a better behavior at zero. But it's it's bad at infinity. And. Uh, so in particular, if you cancel this guy, let's say if you cancel this guy, then the, this term here, instead of being 7, it will be 8. So you are losing at two places, actually. You are losing in the fact that you have a worse behavior at infinity first. But the other thing which is bad is that you need to control v3 over y to the 8 so that you control this. I mean, you, you'll have a different coefficient, of course. I mean, you'll get that coefficient. So it will, it, it, I mean, I, I don't think it works like that. And maybe that corresponds to some unstable behaviors, but I have no idea. I mean, I don't know, the Frank, you have a uh, In the case which I know, no, it doesn't work. Uh, in some case, for example, uh, there is no solution of such that. It's a prototype where the approximate solution has no meaning. Yeah. Right. It's more uh, the fact that you have an approximate solution doesn't mean automatically that you have a solution which looks like that. Right. Behavior right. attention is too bad. Okay, so um, what are the other steps of the proof? Okay, what are the other steps of the proof? So <coughs> the approximate, the real approximate solution. I mean, here we talked about the approximate solution, but for y small. Actually, y not very small. Like y here can be. Uh, what we discussed is y like s to some power alpha. It can it can go till uh, okay. I'm, at some point we have to choose alpha. I mean it's uh, there is room in choosing alpha. More or less we are choosing at some point we are choosing alpha equal two over seven. I mean it's related also to the powers we had there, but um, I mean there is freedom. So <coughs> what we are what we want to do is to take a cutoff, right? And to plug in u3. Okay. Actually, it turns out, even though, even though at this level, uh, normally u3 is enough. Because when we go to U3, we have V3, and V3 controls everything. But I mean, it's usual thing. We, we push it even, even to U4. Okay. So this is the approximate solution for Y smaller than S to the alpha. But then what happens afterwards? Afterwards, I have to, I want to reach this guy. I want to reach this guy. Now, my b is 1 over s. 
my b is 1 over s, so b is 1 over s. So basically, this guy, u infinity, should be like s plus 1, right? So u infinity is like s plus 1. Okay. Um, okay, you can check that. That will more or less do the job. So, so it's like S, let's say. <coughs> it's like S. Like the difference between S, S plus 1 is not important because all the norms we are going to use, they, they are weighted norms. So what happens far away um, is not that important. Okay, I mean, you, you cannot really make it y square, but it's uh, like constant at infinity is fine because of the weights we are going to use. So then what we do, more or less, here actually what I'm going to do is um, subtracting y square over 2, okay, for some small reason. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's just a choice, but plus 1 over b, some function theta, because the y square will be coming from here. So the th theta behaves like y square over 2 for y small, and it behaves like 1. Um, for y large, okay? So basically, you just take that profile that we constructed. We only keep it when y is less than s to the alpha. Then we want our solution to behave like, there is a region where it will behave more or less like y squared over 2, and then it will behave like um, 1 over b, which is s. So, so in a sense, there are more or less like three regions. So there is this region s alpha. There is a region which is more or less uh, s to the 1 half. And then there is a region uh, at infinity, right? So here, it's really the approximate solution. Here, it's more or less y2 over and here it's like 1 over s, uh, sorry, s, right? So that's how your approximate solution looks like. Um, okay. Okay, so this is the approximate solution. Then, <coughs> um, then the next part of the proof is to to perform some good energy estimate on, on the rest, which is uh, V, right? So then we write our solution as U equal U up plus V, and then we need some estimate on V. Okay, now, <coughs> There are two types of estimate. We'll do some maximum principal type estimate. And the second type are energy, energy type with weight. <coughs> okay. So, and it's very important that I need whatever norm I'm going to use on V. So I need a norm on V. But I need this norm to control the trace of V uh, divided by Y7. So I need this to control V. So v, v is what I called here V3. So I need this to control I need a norm that controls that. And that one thing, and also I need to make sure that this 
whenever I'm estimating this, I want this to be better than 1 over S2 plus some eta, right? So those are, those are the two things. The, the requirements is that I need a norm to be strong enough so that it controls this guy. Then it controls Bs plus B2. And I need it to be smaller than this. Because if I am smaller than this, then I can deduce that my B is like 1 over S plus something smaller. Okay. So that's, that's at the end the whole game. Um, so any questions about this or? Uh, 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 okay, so uh, can you be more precise about N? And okay, yeah, so N, <coughs> N can be for instance, an example of N, an example of N is that if you can take something like this. Right? If you take something like that, that will, I, I mean, at least it will do this. Of course, now in our choice, we take something more complicated with weights and so on. Right? It's, but, but that's really the point, that whenever you take trace, whenever you apply trace theorems, you can, you can control it. Uh, uh, at the end, we are using something <coughs> adapted to the linearized operator. Right? Uh, yeah, okay, maybe, um, yeah, I, c I can say a few words about that. No, it's, I, I don't think it's technical. I, I, I mean, I, th I think there is a good idea there, so maybe I can explain it. Um, so, so uh, you see, like, the way the operator here is given, the way the operator is given, it's not really an evolution in S. Uh, in you have us here, but you have also us here. So um, this is not very nice if you want to do energy estimates. I mean, you are slightly uh, you don't know what to use. So it turns out there is an idea. You have to put these two together. And uh, okay, I mean. Th th this difficulty is also slightly related to what we see whenever we do uh, Rayleigh operators. When one looks at uh, linearization of Euler, we get something, sometimes things like that, or also linearization of Prentor. So, um, <coughs> so uh, an idea that we introduced is to introduce operators of this nature. So, so this L, um, so if, if I do this, if I introduce this, um, then actually my equation, my equation will look like this. <coughs> my equation can look like LU US minus BU2. So just introduce this, uh, this notation. So somehow you combine these two terms together. Then what you do is that you apply LU minus 1 to, the, to everything. And you can check that LU minus 1 makes sense and you can apply it. And then it turns out that LU minus 1 applied to this, you can compute it, it's simple. LU minus 1 applied to this is simple, you can compute. And then um, what you end up with at the end, and this is one of the version of the, of the equation that we use. Okay, so let me write, write, write it down. 
So this is a very, uh, I mean, there are some interesting cancellation that happened that uh, minus LU So this is, this is your new equation. I mean, here we use the fact that LU minus 1 applied to U squared give you this. LU minus 1 applied to this give you this. I mean, there are identity that you. So then the good thing is that the nonlinearity only appears here now. So this is, again, this sort of things, I, I think Frank is more, seems, lo looks like, type of things that also you, you, you see, like this sort of transport. Um, um, right. And <coughs> the fact that we put, uh, the fact that you differentiate more, you get more damping also, right? So now you differentiate more, you get more damping. So then you differentiate till you get this kind of dumping. And that, that will be the idea of the energy estimates. Now, <coughs> we will not be using uh, this kind of things because these kind of things do not commute very well. But it's more, uh, it's more like applying this kind of operator many times. I mean, like we, we introduce an operator related to this guy and you apply it. OK, so that's, that's uh, OK. Any questions about this? So I think, uh, yeah, we spent more, m most of the time talking about one result. So, so le le let me mention, um, let I, I, I want to finish by talking about a few other papers uh, by other people but that I found interesting in, in uh, that are recent papers about results related to parental. And it turns out like the, the interesting thing is that some of the difficulties that we saw here, like for instance, this kind of, this kind of object, they are also hidden in all those works. Like at some point, I mean, at some point you have to deal with the fact that your uh, equation, if you want to think about it is as an evolution, you need to do something to this US, right? Because the US appears in two terms. So, um, Okay, so I'm going to mention two um, one result that I, I found interesting. So let me mention this: a result by Samir Ayer <coughs> about long time behavior of uh, it's about long time behavior of Prandtl, but when the pressure is zero. Okay, so, so of course now the, the, the separation that we have here was really driven by the pressure. It's really the pressure that is pushing you to, to become negative in a sense, right? So if you don't put the pressure, so if, you, if you look at Prentol with, um, with zero pressure, so if you look at this equation, Okay, same initial data, ev everything is same. <coughs> so in this case, um, the, the result of Olenik, uh, the result of Olenik gives you global existence. Okay, so Olenik gives you global existence. So, <coughs> so then, um, so Prentol had a student, Prentol in 1904 wrote this equation, had a student, his name was uh, Blasius, and uh, maybe a few years after Prentol, maybe in 1908 or, uh, 
he, stud he looked at self-similar solution of this. So as I said, when you put zero, somehow you have much more scalings, right? And um, one scaling, which is maybe more natural, I think, is like some sort of parabolic scaling, where you scale y like square root of x, right? You can scale y like square root of x. And if you do that, so if you introduce eta equal y over square root of x, and you can add a point, you can add plus x zero if you want, but and that's how it appears afterwards. But if you look at this guy, and you try to find solution of this equation, then you have profiles, which are these Blasius profiles, and which are, um, like in application, turns out to be really very important. Like all physical, I mean, many of the profiles that we see as solution for Prandtl, I mean, when you don't have a pressure, are coming from this. And there is a reason behind it, because that's really the long time, the large x behavior of, um, of this Prandtl with zero pressure. So <coughs> then you can look at solutions. Um, it's not difficult to see that you can look at a solution that behaves like this. Okay, so you can find a solution that that um, that behaves like that. Okay. Um, I mean, because this will satisfy the incompressibility, this satisfies the incompressibility, and then you plug it in, and you derive an equation on f, right? So there is an equation on f, right? You get that f should satisfy this. So it becomes just an ODE, and then you, you fix you fix, I mean, you need this to be zero because that's the um, initial condition. And then um, you, also, you also fix uh, f prime at infinity. OK, so you can fix f prime at infinity. And the fact that also f of eta over eta goes to 1 at infinity. OK, so we fix all this. If you fix all this, then you can solve that ODE. You get an F. You scale it like this. And that gives you a solution. So these are solution of um, um, of course, here we are fixing some behavior at infinity, right? So uh, uh, since, uh, right, so again, since you don't have a pressure, since you don't have a pressure, <coughs> it means that, uh, it means that U Euler has to be a constant, right? Because remember, like, uh, the U Euler and the pressure are, are related. So this is the case where, uh, u at infinity goes to 1, right? So this is the case that u of y goes to 1 when y goes to infinity, OK? So this is all this? OK. So Blasius constructed this guys, uh, this solution 1908. Now, what uh, this guy, Samir, did, like recently, um, is to prove that solutions of this equation, they relax to, um, they converge to the Blasius profile. Right? So this is a long time behavior type of result. Okay. So um, I should mention that his result was already proved, actually. So, but what I like about his result is more like the method used, and which has uh, 
some potential for other things. So, uh, so as I said, so um, Olenik, Olenik gives global existence. Blasius, this is 1908, constructed this sort of particular solution. Now, there is a result from 66 by Serin. who proved using maximum principle, using maximum principle techniques, but not only maximum principle, but also you need to go to the so-called von Miles coordinate. We mentioned this uh, last time. The von Miles is change of coordinate. So you go, you make this change of coordinate, <coughs> and then use maximum principle technique to prove that the u, if you take a u here, you start with an initial data, not, which is not the Blasius profile, you can prove that u will relax to some Blasius profile. So, so the. <coughs> So you, you get the fact that U uh, relaxes to Blasius. Okay. So there is some sort of dumping, some sort of dumping that pushes you to look like Blasius as X goes to infinity. Okay, so it's more like a relaxation result. So I mean, I found this interesting because even that proof, uh, it's not completely, uh, okay, so um, what, what this guy did is to restudy that, but more using energy estimates. Finding the right energies and so on, which is, I think, very important in this business to be able to do things by energy estimates. Now, these are, this is one type of result that are recent that I find interesting. So there is another, two other results that I want to mention, but maybe don't have too much time, but um, the two other results are one by, um, by Go and Guy and the other one is by um, David Gerard Varé and uh, and Yasunuri Mayakawa. Um, more or less around the same time more or less about the same time, which is about the validity of the Prandtl equation. Validity. Validity of the stationary Prandtl. <coughs> Both are from... So, so somehow the Prandtl system we derived it based on some asymptotics, right? Nothing, uh, I mean, the result of conversions to Prandtl are very few. And like in the evolution case, some of these results use analyticity. And okay, Wednesday I will mention another result that I, I have with, uh, Gerard variant Mayakawa, where we have to use, we need Gevray regularity. But it turns out in the stationary case, it can be done in Sobolev, right? So that's the interesting thing in Sobolev. So they can prove the validity of the Prandtl in Sobolev regularity. So it turns out like the setup they have are different um, for Gerard 
uh, for David and Yasunuri, they, they look at the problem in, in the periodic setting in X. So you look at something periodic in X, you, put, you take some solution of Navier-Stokes with periodic data, so there's no boundary condition to be imposed here and here because it's periodic. And they, they put also some assumption about the, the profile for Prentor, which is independent of X. So they are taking some solution which is independent of X, of Prentor, and um, they can prove that solution of Navier-Stokes will converge to the solution of Prentor. I mean, the important thing at the end of the day is that you have a way of deriving Prentor rigorously from Navier-Stokes. So that's the setup here. The setup here actually is more interesting, like more general, um, because they are working in, in um, here, like between they have a flow that goes in. <coughs> so they have to impose some boundary condition, but the, the, the type of boundary condition they have to impose are quite complicated. Like you cannot, I mean, it's similar to the type of uh, approximate thing that you impose. So you, you, th they, have a, they have an approximate solution that they compute to very high order. And they need it to be compatible with the boundary condition. Okay, so they impose that. They have to choose L small. Same here, they need, to, th th there is a condition about smallness in L. And same thing, they, they can prove that solution of Navier Stokes will converge to the solution of Prentor. Um, I mean, both proofs are really long. I mean, th this one has like 100 pages. So, I mean, both proofs are really not very trivial. Um, one of the interesting facts about this, even though um, these kind of things seem different from what I was talking about here, but uh, like, let's say an object like this guy also has to be used in both proofs. Like you need to, you need to understand uh, how you can extract ux from that transport to structure. Um, okay, let me stop here.